Hey, it's Joe, and this is the second installment in the Quant Trading and Futures video series. Today we'll be discussing the basics of quantitative trading. So what is a quant trading strategy? It's a systematic set of trading rules for entering and exiting positions in financial markets followed without discretion and supported by data. The goal is to identify and profit from a market inefficiency. How do we do this? Well, it is quant trading, so lots of math, statistics, machine learning, use of big data and alternative data. And on the trading end of quant trading, it's important to have strong intuition of how financial markets work. And intuition coming from economics and psychology is also very useful in generating trading strategy ideas. So let's talk about systematic versus discretionary trading. Systematic trading is the scientific approach to trading. It is data-driven. Systematic strategies use more data over a longer period. The human brain can only process so much data. So if you're a discretionary trader, you can only trade a handful of markets because you can't watch them all. Discretionary traders have probably been trading less than five years, so you only have the past five years of data to rely on. And even if you've been trading longer, say 10, 15 years, most likely recency bias is going to creep in that it's natural to give more weight to something that happened yesterday than to something that happened 10 years ago. So basically, your brain is not as good of a data processor as a computer is. So through systematic trading, quant trading strategies, you can look at a longer period. You can easily go back 20, 30, even 40 years. You can look at more data. You can do this for more markets and build a, a bigger picture. There's no recency bias. Systematic strategies are testable discretionary strategies are not. So if you're trading discretionarily, you won't really know if your strategy is working until you've been trading it for a long time. You can't go back and back test a discretionary trading strategy. You can't go back and be like, well, would I have foreseen the financial crisis in 2008? Because you already know that it happened. It's already in your brain. You can't take that out of your brain, right? Systematic strategies trade more frequently, putting the law of large numbers to work. The law of large numbers that states that as the sample size grows, the mean of the sample will approach the true mean, the true expectation. So if you're trading a systematic strategy, you can get to the level of statistical significance regarding what the true mean is much sooner than you can if you're doing a discretionary trading strategy. Finally, systematic trading is emotionless. So let's say you had a really bad week, you've lost a lot of money. If you're a discretionary trader, you'll almost certainly be more risk averse. It's just natural. If you're a, a systematic trader, you have a quant trading strategy, you can just sit back and let the machine do its thing and you're not subject to these emotions that can cause you to make bad trading decisions. So let's walk through an example of a quant trading strategy, specifically the moving average cross. So I'm gonna define a couple terms here, MA1, it's going to be the average price over the past N1 trading days, and MA2 will be the average price over the past N2 trading days, with N1 less than N2. The algorithm is very simple. Buy if MA1 is greater than MA2, sell if MA1 is less than MA2. And the picture here illustrates the strategy. You can see when the short-term moving average crosses below the long-term moving average, you want to be short. And if it crosses above, you want to be long. The parameters of this strategy are N1 and N2. We're going to talk a lot about trading parameters later on, so important to understand this. The intuition is that if the short-term moving average crosses above the long-term moving average, markets entered into an uptrend, you want to be long. If the opposite has occurred, the markets entered into a downtrend, you want to be short. The assumption here is that the trend will continue. This is a, a trend following or a momentum type of trading strategy. Next time we're going to talk about what exactly that means. What's the central assumption of quant trading? What do we need to assume to make quant trading make any sense at all? We need to assume that patterns in financial markets that have existed in the past will continue to exist in the future because the whole goal is to identify these patterns in the past. So if we don't make the assumption that they'll continue to exist in the future, then the entire endeavor is, is not worthwhile. So this is the key assumption. What is backtesting? I've mentioned backtesting before. Backtesting is the process of evaluating a trading strategy by testing it on historical data. How do you do a backtest? 
first thing you need to do is find or come up with a trading strategy idea. So this isn't easy, of course. It's important that the trading strategy idea makes sense economically or psychologically, and that the trading rule should not come from a computer. It shouldn't come from some machine learning model or whatnot, because these models are very good at picking up on erroneous patterns that don't make sense intuitively and therefore are unlikely to continue to work in the future. Many times simple strategies work better than complicated strategies. Complicated strategies are more prone to overfitting. We'll talk more about overfitting in a future video. Where do you get these ideas from? You get them from academic papers, from books, the internet. The problem with these sources is one, if they were very good ideas, they probably wouldn't be out there, they wouldn't be published. And two, even if they were a good idea, everyone has access to it. So other traders have probably found it, are trading it themselves, and that's going to take a lot of, if not all, the edge away. So a lot of times for a good trading strategy, yourself is really the best source. So the, the main trading strategy I've been trading for myself, for the managed accounts, and for the hedge fund, this is a trading strategy I developed on my own. It didn't come from any outside source. But sometimes we can find strategies from outside sources, and sourcing these strategies is a common intern project for those that intern for Clark Street or Finalize. All right, so step one, find or come up with a trading strategy idea. Step two, specify the possible markets. What markets does this trade? And then specify the parameter space. What are the parameters? What values can they take? After that, you code up the trading algorithm. It's important you use the spliced and back-adjusted continuous futures series correctly. We talked about that in the last video. After that, you want to compute the positions. We do allow fractional positions. I know you can't trade fractional positions in real life, but the goal of this backtest is just to find out if the strategy would have worked. And if you increase the capital amount, then you won't need to trade fractional positions. You can trade whole positions and the rounding of the positions is unlikely to take the edge away. So you can always go back and redo it with rounding assumptions, but for first run of the back test, we're going to allow fractional positions. You record the PL for each trading day, the profit and loss. You do this both without and with transaction costs. You do it without to see if there's any edge there at all. If it doesn't make money even with no transaction costs, you can pretty much just throw it away. And with to see if the edge persists after accounting for these costs. So you can't actually trade a, a trading strategy if there's no edge after costs because it's it's a reality that you have to pay these transaction costs in real life. But sometimes there'll be a strategy that works well without costs and it goes away and you apply the transaction costs and you can modify the strategy to trade less frequently, for example, to minimize those costs and keep the edge. Coding these trading strategies is another common intern project. Sourcing and coding up the, the strategies. Those are the two big ones. So more on transaction costs. How do we compute them? It's the sum of all costs associated with trading one futures contract. Of course, we'd multiply this by however many contracts we're trading. The commission, this is the fee you pay to the brokerage. It varies based on which brokerage you're using. Could be anywhere from 25 cents to a dollar. Exchange fee, what you pay to the exchange. Again, it varies, could be one to two dollars. NFA fee is just a couple pennies, and then one tick of slippage, which is 5 to $15, depending on the product you're trading. So what is slippage? I'm going to talk a lot more about slippage in a later video when we get to execution, but slippage for now is the difference between the current price and the price you can actually trade at. So as far as the math, if we're assuming one tick of slippage, which is usually a fair assumption, if you're trading a fairly liquid futures market, you're not trading enormous size, one tick of slippage is usually a safe assumption. And that formula is you multiply the tick size by the contract multiplier. So to give an example, crude oil, remember it's a thousand barrels. So the contract multiplier for crude oil is a thousand. The tick size is a penny. So one tick of slippage in crude oil would be $10. So let's go through an example now. Let's back test the moving average cross. What would you do? You code up the algorithm. The algorithm, we went through it before. Buy if MA1 goes over MA2. Sell if it crosses below MA2. I'm going to do this on commodity futures. Commodity futures tend to have more of a momentum effect. Talk about this more in next video. Parameter space, throw out some values there for N1 and N2. Positions, this is going to be a vector of ones and negative ones. 
in that we're always going to be either long or short. That's how the strategy works. Raw PL, this is just the vector of the price changes multiplied by the position and the contract multiplier. That's how you compute the, the raw PL. And then the regular PL, just the raw PL, and you subtract out the transaction costs. So I'll end with a comparison of quant trading versus technical analysis. Technical analysis is a very common trading method among retail traders, and there is some overlap between the two, but it's relatively small. So first, let's, let's define technical analysis. It's trading based on chart patterns and technical indicators using exclusively price and volume data. So the moving average cross we looked at, that could be considered a quant trading strategy and a technical analysis trading strategy. But technical analysis in general has a bad reputation. A lot of erroneous patterns, like the head and shoulders pattern, long-legged doji, a lot of silly patterns, insofar as technical analysis has been likened to astrology and palm reading. It's, it's more of the philosophy that you identify some pattern and you just trade based off that pattern, no careful testing, and that's how it differs from quant trading. Quant trading is scientific, disciplined, sophisticated statistical models and machine learning techniques. You have to verify that the pattern is actually real, which technical analysis doesn't go that far. It, it stops a step short. And then finally, quant trading often uses non-price data, whereas technical analysis is exclusively price data. So that will conclude this video on an introduction to quant trading. Next time, we'll go through a lot of the common quant trading strategies out there.